Do you know the best time of worship that we had during the service? In my view, it was when the electricity failed and when we sang together. Because everyone realized that we are the family of God and we are praising God. And something different happens when we as people pray. I want to read the word of God. It's very dark here. <laughs> and the Bible says I should be in the light and walk in the light. So I'm going to read from two passages. Firstly from Mark chapter 5 and then from Romans 16. They're fairly long passages, so I'm going to be selective in them. Jesus and the disciples went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus was saying to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. And then just a verse later on, verse 15, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And then I'm going to read Romans 16, just a couple of selected verses. It's really what I would call the notices. So you'll have to listen to me, you can't look uh, on the screen this morning. The Apostle Paul writes, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Read also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Eponetus, who was the first convert. Greet Mary, greet Andronicus and Junius. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. And then towards the end of the chapter, uh, he writes again, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sassipato, my relatives. Dr. Martin Lloyd King once gave a, a very famous speech that started, I have a dream. Now I want to share some very exciting news with you. And that is that Errol and I have finally discovered that we do have something in common. <laughs> It's taken us almost a year, but we've decided that we both have in common that we love to dream. Um, Errol and I have a kind of cat and dog relationship. I don't know who the cat and who the dog is. You can make that up for yourself. You can decide. It's a kind of love, pretend to hate kind of relationship, you know? It's one where I see Errol as my elder brother, in fact, much, much older brother. <laughs> and so because of that, I tease him, and because he's my much older brother, he puts me in place. But what we discovered is that we love to dream, and we both dream about John. The difference is that he dreams about John Wesley, 
and I dream about John the Baptist. <laughs> but we have a common dream for Norwegian Settlers Church, that we would be and we would increasingly become a church where every single body is somebody, where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Now, our brother Errol preached two weeks ago on the Lordship of Jesus that we need to respond to in the way we live and in the way we speak. And so we need to show people and speak to people and live out the Lordship of Christ. And I know that the church has as its head the Lord Jesus. But I want this morning to speak on the other side of the coin. I want to speak about people and in these two or three weeks that are leading up to our preparation for Advent, we've been invited to take a burden that each one of us has relating to the church here of Norwegian Settlers. And my burden is this, the church is all about people. You'll remember that Jesus summed up God's commands in two. In Mark uh, chapter 12, 28 to 30, he said, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And the second is like it and it's linked to it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Love God wholeheartedly. And I'm putting it in my own words, but love people passionately. Love people passionately. That's what the church is all about. It's a place where we love people passionately as well as God wholeheartedly. The Apostle Paul went even further in Galatians 5 and verse 14. Paul said the entire law is summed up in a single command, not even a double command, a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want you to be absolutely convinced that I'm preaching from a biblical base. And so I've taken these two chapters that we have read. Firstly, from Mark chapter 5. I think it's a well-known story of this uh, demon-possessed man. It's recorded in each one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's a story about this man who was demon-possessed. He came from Garasa, but his life had just become a total wreck. He was uncontrolled, he was uncontrollable. Uh, he ran about naked, he lived in the tombs. He had chains on his hands and his feet that couldn't hold him. So much was his wild power that uh, it was just uh, broken. He was able to break the chains with ease. He cut himself with stones as he lived among the tombs. Daily he would scream and shout. I used my imagination. How do you think that the disciples felt when this man comes running down to the boat? <laughs> I feel they said to Jesus, Jesus, let's go and practice our evangelism somewhere else. <laughs> let's go to a place of quiet and tranquility. This madman is going to kill us. As he came storming on their boat. Jesus was recognized by this demon possessed man. Every time in scripture demon possessed people come into contact with Jesus, they know who Jesus is. And so this man calls out, is that working? Oh, that's wonderful. I don't have to shout. Can you hear me all right? They, not. Okay, well that sounds better, doesn't it? I can spit at you here or not. Um, he calls out, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Um, please tell God that you won't torture me anymore. Jesus had been saying to him, come out, you evil spirit. 
In verse 9, I think that there is one of the most remarkable sentences in Scripture. Where Jesus turns to this man and asks him a question. The question he asks him is, what is your name? What is your name? Here is this wild madman. What is your name? And the man replies, my name is Legion, for we are many. It was a name he had given to himself. Because he had considered that there were as many demons inside him as there were soldiers in a Roman legion, which was 6,000. And so it was his own name. My name is Legion. I am a man possessed by 6,000 demon spirits. For a moment, I just want you to take a kind of oblique view of this story. I want you to compare how the people thought of Legion and assessed him. They assessed him differently. The townsfolk, I'm sure they thought that he was a raving lunatic. If there were any psychiatrists, you're a kind of would-be psychologist here, aren't you? All that mumbo-jumbo that you give us. <laughs> but the psychiatrist would have said, this man has an interesting psychiatric condition. Let's call it multiple personality. Many personalities within him. I think for the disciples, he was a dangerous obstacle. I think some of them probably thought, as they did um, in John chapter 2, with that man who was born blind. And they had a theological problem. For them, legion was a theological problem. Rabbi, was it this man who sinned? Or was it his parents? What caused his present condition? How did Jesus see this man? Jesus saw him as a person. What is your name? There's some commentators who believe that in the ancient world, if you knew someone's name, it gave you a kind of power over him. Uh, there might be a little truth in that, but I think that there is a much simpler explanation. Jesus didn't see him as a number. Jesus didn't see him as a condition. Jesus didn't see him as a conglomeration of demons who had gathered together in this one man. Jesus didn't see him as a diagnosis. Jesus saw him as a person and asked him the question, what is your name? A couple of weeks ago, I was preaching at the care center. I can't see if Rory is with us because it's a bit dark in the back there. But Rory came and he gave his testimony. He always comes, normally sits uh, in the first row, right at the back of the left-hand side of the church. And he said to us, he said, I have been here and I occupied bed number five. And I was here for many months and I had HIV AIDS. And I was here and I want to tell you now, that was about two years ago, the Lord has changed my life around. And I'm not just the occupant of bed number five. He said, my name is Rory. My name is Rory. Some of you have probably seen uh, the film or read the book, The Elephant Man, have you? Yeah, you know what I mean. It's the story of a, of a man with a shocking skin and uh, uh, I don't know what kind of disease it was, they haven't given it a name, but um, the, the result was that he had these awful tumor-like things that grew onto every part of his body. And so he was completely distorted, uh, he was grotesque. The only job that he could get was as a freak, in a freak show. And so he used to go around to the various freak shows where they would parade people as freaks. And they would applaud his freakishness and his shocking looks and so on. Until one of the specialist surgeons from the Royal London uh, Hospital took an interest in him. By that time his jaw was completely distorted and he couldn't even speak. 
And he befriends this man. He couldn't cure his condition because it was incurable, but he worked with him to the point where, first of all, uh, the surgeon uh, could hear him. His name was Frederick Treves. And then even some of the people around him could understand what he was saying. And to me, the most marvelous, the most moving and poignant part in the film is where this elephant man, this distorted uh, person who looked more like a thing, he just looked, he looked like a disease. He stood in front of a group of doctors and said, my name is John, John Merrick, John Merrick. Jesus looked at a man who was distorted, a man who had been destroyed, and he asked him, what is your name? Can I move to Romans chapter 16? And I'm very fortunate because the clock has stopped. You know, that gives a preacher a great advantage. It doesn't, doesn't move beyond quarter to ten. <laughs> And so I should finish at quarter to ten. <laughs> Many of you will know that Romans 16 is called the, or Romans is called the theological epistle. It's, it's the most theological book in the Bible. Of all the letters that were written, it is the deepest theologically. Chapter 1 and 2, um, Paul traces uh, sin that it has become uh, universal among Jews and Gentiles. From chapter 3 to verse 6, the way in which men have fallen and we are now sinful and we need to be justified by faith in the Lord Jesus. That great chapter, chapter 8 on the Holy Spirit, greatest chapter on the Holy Spirit in the Bible, chapters 9 to 11, God's plan for His people, the Jews, and, and what lay ahead for them in the future. And then from chapter 12, the way in which God people, God's redeemed people should live. The Apostle Paul, in the most theological epistle in the whole of Scripture, records the highest number of recorded people of any, of any book in the Bible. And Romans 16 records by name more people in the church than any other passage does. It's just the notices. Let's be honest. The notices aren't usually the highlight of the service, are they? Maybe the treasurer thinks that the offering is, but, the, but then he's biased because he's the treasurer. <laughs> but the notices are usually the point where, where some of us switch off. But here, the Apostle Paul gives us notices. <coughs> I want to remind you that the most theological letter in Scripture refers to more people by name than any other. The Apostle Paul sends personal greetings to 27 people who are named and then to others who are connected to those people. He sends personal greetings from eight people, and they are connected to some others. Now I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul had never been to Rome. He had never met the people who he is greeting by name. So presumably he had met them in his travels all over Asia. But he had recalled their names. And in the most theological passage of all, we have the most concentration of names. The Apostle Paul knew people by name. I was very impressed to hear a story about my hero, uh, the late Dr. John Stott. He was traveling to Keswick um, Convention to preach there. He was being driven by his own chauffeur, just by a friend. And suddenly he said, please stop the car, please stop the car. The person jammed on the brakes and said, why do you want to stop? John Stott got out of the car and he went to the sidewalk to speak to a Nigerian student whom he had met in the past and he greeted him by name. Then he got back into the car. The Keswick speaker stopping the car 
to speak to a man whom he recognized by name. Dale Carnegie said, a man's name is the sweetest and most important sound to him in the English language. I've said to you, my job is to get to know you. <laughs> so when I ask you questions, it's not because I'm interrogating you because I was a prosecutor. I was. It's because I want to get to know you. And I don't get to know you just by kind of saying, how are you? And you say, I'm fine. And then I say, I'm fine. And you say again, I'm fine. And, and we're all fine. And we never go beyond or beneath being fine. And if I call you all brother and sister and brother and sister, and you know when Errol gets old, then he, he kind of forgets names. And so, you know, he forgets who I am and he forgets who he, he is. And so he has to wear the badge to remind him of his name. <laughs> my goal, my passion, my job, my necessity is to get to know you. And, and I want to do that. And that's why I might ask you again and again and again, because my mind is going to. <laughs> what is your name? What is your name? The Apostle Paul not only knew people by name, he was interested in them as people, not just as fellow workers. Uh, if, for example, you look at verse 9, he says, Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend, Stachys. We are not only here as fellow workers, we are fellow workers. We're working together for the sake of the gospel. But we need to be more than just fellow workers. And I want to relate to you, and I want you to relate to me, as being more than just a fellow worker. My dear friend, Stachys. He was interested in people as people and not just fellow workers. I think the turning point in my ministry came when I felt that God was calling me to a pastoral ministry and not just um, a teaching or a lecturing one. When Dr. John Bolton at the London Bible College, as it was then, came back to London Bible College to lecture and he said, I have alternated between the pastorate and theological teaching seminary. And, and I asked him, which do you like the most? And he said, I actually like the pastoral ministry. And I found that a bit strange because he was coming back to a theological seminary. And I said, why did you prefer the pastoral ministry? He said, because I had the great privilege of sharing people's lives. Of sharing people's lives. And I think it was then that God showed me that the ministry isn't just a performance up front. It's not just the delivering of a sermon which you can analyze and you can say, I liked it, I didn't like it. It's a sharing of God's word, uh, not only from me to you, but it's, it's God using me and using others who are here up front to share God's word because we are members of the same family. We need to be friends. We're not just fellow workers. I've never known what the word reverend means. As people sometimes say to me, do you like to be referred to as the reverend? I say, I still don't understand what reverend means. You can gladly call me reverend if you want to. But I want you to see me as being a pastor, a shepherd, a carer. But I also want to see you as a friend. And I want you to, to see me as a friend. And I want us, and I believe God wants us in the church, to be sharing as friends. That we don't just come to a place and we sit and we observe and maybe we sing. And in a sense we participate, but in a distant kind of way. But actually we share each other's lives. The Apostle Paul expressed his gratitude to and for them. Look um, at chapter, at verse 4, where he gives thanks to God for Priscilla and Aquila and for their work. 
Now, he actually thanks God for each of them individually, and he goes through people, name by name, person after person, and he thanks God for them, and he also thanks them for what they meant to him and to the work of the ministry. And that's not only in the letter to the Romans, it's in every letter the Apostle Paul wrote. It's not wrong to say thank you to someone for what he or she has done. In fact, I believe it is wrong not to say that. Um, I remember a man who was, uh, he was a lovely Christian person, but he said, don't thank me for anything. Because if you thank me, you're taking away God's glory. I know that his intention might have been good, but I believe he was wrong. We're not taking away God's glory where we thank God for what others have meant to us. When we say thank you, as the Apostle did over and over again, I want to thank you, I want to thank you for what you've meant to me. Thank you for your work in the ministry. I thank God for you. Gratitude and affirmation are not stealing God's glory. They're part of being human. And you remember when Jesus healed those ten lepers and the one Samaritan leper came and uh, the leper expressed gratitude. What did Jesus say? Where are the other nine? And it was quite clear that Jesus expected them and was disappointed because they didn't return and say thank you. The Apostle Paul treated everyone the same. In verse 3, he speaks to people who are well known in the early church, Priscilla and Aquila. And they were stalwarts, not only in Rome, but also in the Ephesian church, in the Corinthian church. They had moved around, they were wealthy business people, they were the bigwigs, they were very important people. But in verse 10, he greets someone and thanks God for someone whose name is mentioned nowhere else in Scripture. He says, Greet Apelles. Who is Apelles? Apelles is unknown. This is the only reference to Apelles in the whole of Scripture. Unless Paul had thanked Apelles, no one would have known who Apelles was. The Apostle Paul treated every person the same. My brothers and sisters, says James in chapter 2 and verse 1, don't show favoritism in the church. Don't judge people by their outward clothes. Don't judge people by the language that they speak. Don't judge them by the school that they went to. Don't judge them by their bank balance or by their history. Treat every single person the same. Doesn't matter where he came from. It doesn't matter what the color of his skin is. The Apostle Paul treated everyone the same. I want to draw this to a close. It's still quarter to ten, so that's great. <laughs> I want to issue a challenge to the Norwegian Settlers Church. Because this is my burden. This is my burden. This is what I believe God has called me to do at this stage of my life in the Norwegian Settlers Church. I want to read for you the church's vision for 2016. Our vision for this year is to create and nurture a culture of biblical community. How can we do this? Let me give you four suggestions. Four key principles. Number one, people are more important than buildings. Jesus allowed the demons to enter into the pigs. And, um, and remember, that's what the demon said, Lord, don't send us away. And he sent them into the pigs. The pigs ran down the cliff and they all ran over. The cliffs fell into the lake of Galilee and they were all drowned. In verse 17 we read, the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. How amazing! Possibly because Jesus was disturbing their tranquility and they were only too grateful that this madman could be herded out and, and left in the sticks. But I think there was another reason that the text hints at the fact that there were 2,000 pigs and they were very valuable. 
And the trouble was for them, 2,000 pigs were worth more than one person. That's the problem. 2,000 pigs. Work out how many. Our bank manager will do that. He's probably thinking right now. 2,000 times blah, blah, blah. And he could end up three figures at the same time as my dad could. He was also a financial person. Look how much money there is. My friends, I want to tell you that one person, any person, is more valuable than all the pigs in this world. I know sometimes people behave like pigs. No, maybe I shouldn't go there. <laughs> I think I told you uh, once before that Anne and I had an engagement party. It was a very clever ruse to have a double wedding. So we had an engagement party, party in London and uh, I asked the Reverend Pat Goodland, who was Matt Sturitz, Stanmore Baptist Church, if we could borrow the church projector in order to show a dreadful film about South Africa, but that's another story. When I asked to borrow the projector, uh, Patrick Goodland said, um, I'm not sure, because we have a church policy not to let the projector go outside of the church. But then he said something that I've never ever forgotten. He said, but people are more important than things, and I'll see what I can do. And we used that projector. I want to tell you, my friends, your family is more important than your car. Your children, your, your mom and your dad and your relatives and your loved ones are far, are far more value than your house or your car or any other possessions. People are more important than things. Personal relationships are not built up through SMSs and emails. I don't even know the names of them. Now, I know I'm a, I'm a dinosaur. My children say in terms of modern technology, I'm an absolute dinosaur. <laughs> so I confess that. But I still insist that we don't get to know people by sending emails and by SMSs and so on. We, we send information. It's a good way of sending information. But it's not the way to build up relationships. People are more important than things. Secondly, people are more important than programs. Legion begged Jesus, Jesus, I want to be a traveling evangelist. I want to go on the mission to Lambert's Bay. Oh, that's what I want to do. Let me join your group at Lambert's Bay. Sounds great. Let's, let, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, no. I want you to go back home. And I want you to tell your family and loved ones how much God has done for you. People are more important than programs. Important as they are. People are more important than projects. This church has the most incredible outreach program and concern for the community of any church that I've ever been part of. And I'm totally committed to it. But I want to say without apology that people are more important than programs and projects. We have a building program which is, uh, is marvelous. I think the people you had faith that I don't know that I have. But what I want to say is my conviction and my passion is more, it's more for the people who will fill the buildings than it is for the quality of the building. I'm more concerned for the people we have here than for the marvelous techniques that God has given to us. I mean, we blessed them with the most incredible people. I mean, Mark's face is a problem. I told him that this morning. But he does a, a marvelous work, and he was going to. I think you're going to give us that, uh, that little clip on the baptism service, weren't you, Mark? Yeah, so it's a shame about your face, but, but it's... <laughs> Because he's doing my face. And, you know, those people who are baptized, they're important. And we should be remembering them by name. And we must do that. Because, you see, people are more important than things. People are more important than statistics. People are more important than buildings. People are more important than, than worshipping eloquence and excellence. 
When God's people come together, when they are united, and I just felt as I sat down, and suddenly we had no more music, and we had no electricity, I just felt the Spirit of God, and I heard someone in the back singing, uh, what do you call that when you match? Um, yeah, kind of synchronizing, you know, it just puts my singing to shame. But I just heard God's people kind of coming together in a worship that lifted my spirit. When Errol prayed, it wasn't just he who prayed, I prayed with him. And I know you were praying with him. You see, it's the church is all about people. People are the most important and valuable commodity in our church. I put commodity in inverted commas because people are never a commodity. People should never be slaves who are sold. People should never be numbers on hospital beds. People should never be anonymous patients on a list. People are people with names, with values, with families. Psalm 8 and verse 5, you crowned mankind with glory and honor. Because men are more than animals. I've just come back from the game reserve and no one must decry any animal. Now I'm very passionate about animals. But I want to tell you that people are even more important than animals. I want to tell you that it's not our buildings. It's not our history. And I'm very important. I think it's important to preserve our history. I'll do everything I can to preserve the history of this church. Don't throw it away. We need to value our history. But our value doesn't lie in our history. Our most important uh, commodity isn't our history or our musical instruments. You see, they're quiet now. Even the drum is quiet. But I like the drum. I'd love one day to see every single musical instrument paraded here in worship. That's what I would like to see. Every single musical instrument used to the glory of God. But I want to say it's not the instruments. It's the people who wield them. It's the people who use them. The most valuable commodity in our church is people. I've chosen the word. I was going to speak about a passion for people. I just thought that might sound a bit twee. I've got two books at home that are called A Passion for Souls. Two different books. And I've moved away from that. That's how I grew up. We must have a passion for souls. But you know, friends, I've never seen a soul. I don't know what a soul is. I can't see a soul. I can't speak to a soul. I can only care for a soul who has a body. I can only care for the soul that is within a human person and has a family and he has a job or he doesn't have a job and he has challenges in life and uh, uh, he's struggling with cancer and so on. And so I've come all the way back to where I started. My friends, the church is all about people. I know it's about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so I'm saying under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church is all about people. And what is the church? We are the church. Who are the church? You are. I am. We are. God's people living in true community, sharing each other's lives. What is our church? We are God's church at Norwegian Settlers Church. We're not just people who come to a building once or twice a week. We are God's family. 1 John 3 verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we actually are. God's family, the church. The church is all about people, my friends. Under the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have the most incredible privilege of being the church. 
of becoming the church that God wants us to be. Not a, just a church that has so many attendees every week, but a church that is the church. People living together in true community. People sharing each other's homes. People relating in some depth to each other. Not how are you, I am fine, I am fine. How are you, you are you fine, I am fine. <laughs> but people who, who share each other's lives. Because we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his family. We truly are. Father, please help us to be what you have made us to be. Your church, your family, we're far from perfect and we know that as with every other church, there are weaknesses, there are failings, we acknowledge them. And we also recognize and we apologize for, and Lord, we confess that we aren't always what we should be. But Lord, my prayer is that you would keep us from superficiality, keep us from just looking at what people are on the outside and sometimes holding people at a distance and believing that they are irretrievable and they need to be consigned to the tombs of life. Please may our church be increasingly a place where people are drawn not just because of the excellence of the worship and the magnificence of, of all the facilities you've given to us, but because of the depth of their relationships. So Lord, please make us a true community, sharing, loving, living, honest, open people, sinful people, people who make mistakes all the time, but people who are your people, becoming more like the Lord Jesus and growing more and more into the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.